right, we'll have to get out some food. and all of that is because of um, your beer drinking tonight. So thanks, thank you for coming today to do that. Uh, we're excited to have Neil Young here and um, I will stop talking and hand it over to him. So thanks for coming. Thank you so much. And Doug, I appreciate you doing this event for Eagle Eye Books. And there, uh, no educator with row. Go by and take a look at it. I was, I was over there yesterday, and it's a wonderful, wonderful bookstore. Doug and Mike, you're going to give them a discount? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. For, uh, and I appreciate all of you coming to hear about my book, Georgia May, The Most Important Figures Who Shaped the State of Georgia in the 20th Century. Why did I decide to write a book? And why did I pick the most influential Georgians to be included in the book? A few years ago, I had two operations on the left side of my head up there to correct a benign cancer condition. The result of the op operation caused me to lose my ability to speak and write. And you can imagine being a journalist, what kind of a shock that was. <clears throat> I had to receive major therapy to correct the condition, and it was benign, so thank the Lord for that. I didn't, didn't have to go any further. But I had a wonderful uh, person, a woman, to help me regain the ability to speak. The condition is called aphasia, aphasia and it robs you of the ability to communicate. An example of aphasia would be Mixing up two words like cemetery and sem seminary, which is what one of my friends did one time. He told his dad that he was going to the, into the ministry. The dad was taking it back, and when his so son told him that, and he told him told his dad, "I'm going to cemetery." <laughs> did I say that right? <laughs> I meant seminary, right? Mm -hmm. Now you understand the meaning of aphasia. And you'll see me skip on some words and that sort of thing. So you just have to think, I'm almost there, at 90%, right? My therapist treated me by asking me to write as best I could any kind of document. And then I would give it to her and correct, she would correct it and then she would give it back to me and then I would read it back to her. That's the therapy. Over time, and it took a little while, my therapist helped me to be able to write and speak again. In the therapy, I tried to find something that, that I really liked to write about. And for over 20 years, my magazine, Georgia Trend, would pick the most influential Georgians in the, from the previous year. So I came up with the idea of writing about the most influential Georgians of the 20th century, not this century, of course. I like to write columns concerning history, and I've been privileged to be on the board of the Georgia Historical Society. So to write the book, I picked people from political and other disciplines, including authors, business people, sports, religion, and others. I used history books, advice from other historians, websites, and other methods to pick the subjects to write about. I started my writing career in 1958 as a journalist for my family newspaper, the Valos Daily Times. So over the years, I have interviewed and known many of the people listed in, this, in the book that from the latter part of the century. 
Sam Nunn and Zell Miller and uh, authors and famous authors who lived in the 20th century. I thought I would share a few of these selections for you tonight. We all know about Jimmy Carter. He was the peanut farmer from a small town in South Georgia, near just below the fall line around America's Georgia. He ran for governor of Georgia, and as his term ended, he entered the national political scene. And to the surprise of many people, he won to be the president of the United States. Another famous person was civil rights leader, Martin Luther King. Luther King. He grew up in Atlanta, and in this, his story in the book tells how he became not only the most famous Georgian, but also the most influential person in America and the world. But the, one of the people in the book you won't know, Martha Mary Berry was a young girl in the 1930s Depression area who was from Rome, Georgia. She created a school to help, help educate children who came from poor families near her home. Times were hard in the school. And Berry sent a letter to auto magnate Henry Ford. You still, we all still have Fords, right? And he, uh, he didn't ask any, he didn't even know where you know, Rome, Georgia was. So he sent her a dime. She was really discouraged about that. She took the dime to a feed store and purchased 10 cents of peanut seeds. The students planted the peanuts. And at the end of the season, they harvested a crop and sold it for $1,500. Barry deposited the money. Then she wrote out a $1,500 check which she sent to Ford, <clears throat> along with a letter that read, Mr. Ford, here's your $1,500 return on your dime that you invested in Barry's school. She noted that the peanuts were grown by the students. Ford was really impressed by this. He took a train from New York back down to Rome, Georgia, and met with Barry to look over her school. When he left, he gave her $3 million. That's a lot of money back in those days. With other donations, her school grew, grew up to be 129 buildings with 27,000 acres. When she died in 1942, Berry College was named the most beautiful college in America. Another gentleman that we have in the book is Ted Turner. He's the most outrageous person on the list. Turner grew up in Savannah and after flunking out of Brown University, joined his father's outdoor advertising business, which was a small business in, the, in that city. When his, when his father died, Turner became president and turned the company from a small business into a billion dollar company. Turner experienced many highs and of mania that led him into a lot of tricky ventures, business ventures. He expanded his family business all over to radio, TV, sports, including owning, owning the Atlanta Braves and many other businesses. His empire was always in debt with cash. And they had no cash. Things were, came tight. He visited a friend, Tom Cousins, and to ask for a million dollar loan to help him make his monthly payroll. He needed it, you know, just to get out, just to get out of the dodge. At the time, there was only three TV networks on television, ABC, CBS, and NBC. Cousins gave him a million dollars and said, what are you doing next, Ted? And Ted said, I'm gonna put all these network networks out of business. I'm gonna create a new television network called CNN, and it was gonna provide 24-hour news coverage all over the world. When Ted left, Cousins went to his friends and said, I just gave a million dollars to a crazy man. In 1996, media giant Tom Warner purchased Turner Broadcasting for $7.5 billion. The merger didn't work very well, but Turner still left with over $2.5 billion. 
And with his wealth, he became a significant person giving money to good causes and pledging one billion to the United Nations. He also established the Nuclear Threat, threat Initiative with former Senator Sam Nunn. I wouldn't say this one too bad, really, for a man who flunks out of college and changed the world. One person you won't know about is Bob Shower. He was president of Georgia Power in the 1970s. He's the man that kept the lights on in Georgia. When he became the president of Georgia Power, the, the, it's hard to believe, but Georgia Power was almost broke. They had the oil embargo, fuel, gas fuels went up to $5 a gallon. Uh, the sun, country went into a major recession, and inflation was at 18%. And that's hard to believe when it's, well, it's, everybody's worried about it being up to 4 or 5 right now, but it was 18%. He became president. He was directed to try to change everything around. So he took an optimistic approach and delivered a message of hope to his employees and then to the public. Most companies would just kind of duck around and wouldn't, wouldn't even admit to anything. But he told the public in a series of newspaper ads about the crisis with the company. And so it was a serious thing. So it worked. It was not long before at the end of the year, Georgia Power kind of came out of the slump. And they, they came out of the crisis. In 1985, Sheriff partnered a partner with the Salvation Army to assist people dealing with challenging times who needed food, clothing, clothing and shelter. The program was called Share. The customers could add $1, $2, or $10 to their monthly utility bill. Georgia Power would match the donation. The successful program assists more than 50,000 families annually. SHARE has collected $72 million to help those in need. When SHARE retired in 1989, at the and at the time of his death in 2008, Georgia Power is the largest utility in the Southeast. But he is remembered for the man who started SHARE and also, who in hard times, kept the lights on in Georgia. <clears throat> Another famous person, person is Coach Vince, Vince Dewey. Go dogs. <laughs> he's, regard, <laughs> he's regarded the greatest football coach in the 25 years, and in his 25 years season, he uh, compiled a 201 versus 77 uh, record loss. Sounds like Nick, Nick Saban, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. In 1980, he led the team to win the national championship was named ACC Coach of the Year. After his retirement in 2004, Dooley launched, launched another career as an author, gardener, and a historian. He and his wife, Barbara, are keynote speakers and entertain people in community events all over the state, helping to earn money for nonprofit causes. In 1919, the Board of Regents honored Dooley by naming the field at Stanford Stadium Dooley Field. In the 1930s and 1940s, Governor Eugene Talmadge, Talmadge, Talmadge dominated politics in Georgia on a platform that made segregation and white supremacy his main theme. He developed a reputation for a man who disregarded ethics and ruled with a corrupt, corrupt manner. He built himself as the poor man's friend and was a colorful character wearing red suspenders and a straw hat. He grew large crowds taking on the rich Atlanta elite, except he called him the elite, elite and those lying Atlanta newspapers. The public loved his speeches and screamed, Give him hell, Gene! When Tamage was accused of pocketing $20,000 in state revenue funds, more than $300,000 today, he just guessed. He said, he said, okay, I did it. I stole it. 
I stole it for you, the people of Georgia. Voters didn't even care, and they kept him in office. In one election, Thomas called an election official in, the, in a small county and said, how many people of you have voted for me? The official said, well, how many do you need, Gene? <laughs> Tamwich lost his next term of governor to a more moderate man named Ellis Arnold. But Tamwich was not finished. The election in 1946 voted back in office. To make sure he'd win the race, he ran his son, Herman, who was 26 years old, as an alternative candidate. Talmadge passed away, he died, before he could take office. Nevertheless, he tried to control the election. In his will, he insisted that his son, Herman, take over his place. This action caused the three governor contra controversy. That made Georgia a national laughing stop. stop. Over, it was all over the country, even over the world, what was happening. No fewer than, fewer than three men claimed that they were governor. Herman Tamich was the, the outgoing governor. Ellis Arnold and Ellen Melvin E. e. Thompson, Thompson, they all thought they were the governor. Herman Tamich seized the governor's office and changed the locks on the door. Arnold set up a satellite office on another site right down from, from the, his office. And Melvin Tom, Thompson, who was a lieutenant governor, said he was governor. All three, three think they were elected. Now this went on for two months. And a lot of whiskey and liquor uh, flowed in the Capitol, and it was just a big time for everybody. But nobody could write a check. You know, the people weren't getting paid. So, there's more. <laughs> An Atlanta newspaper man named George Godwin found voting fraud in Talmadge's hometown in Telfair County. Godwin found that some citizens rose from their graves and were counted and voted for Herman Talmadge. The dead voters were counted in alphabetical order. So it seems kind of strange, wasn't it? This fraud story also made national newspapers and radio stations all over the country. Godwin won a full surprise for exposing Talmadge's crooked effort to change the election, even after his death. In March 1947, the Supreme Court ruled that the duly elected Lieutenant Governor, Mel Melvin Thompson, was the new governor. All this proves that the more things change, the more they stay, they stay the same. <laughs> Does this sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> Truett Cathy built an empire out of a chicken sandwich. To lure customers away from fast food burgers, he devised a billboard campaign promoting the billboard cows on the, on the billboard to tell people to eat more chicken. Cows would write, tell them the cows sent you. Eat more chicken. All roads lead to chicken. Eat more chicken. Beef puts you to sleep. He had a, gal a Valentine measure that said, Cows say, roses are red, violets are blue. Eat more chicken. Move. <laughs> my, ass would, my book would like to ask you if you could apply this exercise with yourself your children and your grandchildren, so that you can come up with your own list or add to Georgia Maid's selection. It will open up for you an important perspective of Georgia events. And I hope this writing book, writing this book will encourage other people who have aphasia, strokes, or other brain injuries that they can hope that they can have right, proper treatment they can lead a successful life. Many of those included in Georgia Maid are already in their graves, soon to be joined by all of us, and they will be remembered collectively in the powerful march of Georgia history. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. Nice reception. Any questions? 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, Neely, uh, am I remembering correctly? You mentioned the project share. Didn't you personally have well, something? Well, something that? about it. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, was that a yes? <laughs> <laughs> Were you working with the Salvation Army? Yes, that, that was me. <laughs> well, I gotta throw, I gotta throw a few things in there, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Is that still in uh, operation? Now? Yes, yes, it's, it's been very, very successful. And Georgia Power uh, just added another uh, one and a half times. They did match it one to one. Now it's one and a half. But that was one of the first times that, you know, now every time you go in a grocery store, they're, they're saying you can donate to the Red Cross or different things. But that was one of the first instances, that's 85, where that, that happened. And it was very successful. And other charities are doing it now. I think it's a great thing to do. Yes, sir. That's a great job putting the new people uh, in with us and the people who are going to well, I, yes, I, especially the latter part. That, uh, uh, Sam Nunn's a real close friend of mine. Uh, Zell Miller. Uh, I, I was I started in 1958, uh, and so a lot of the people in the book I, I actually interviewed and did stories on. Uh, I, I got most of this this information that is a, is a, 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 a I got bi biographical sketches and books that have been written about them. And so that was where a lot of my sources are. And then also my own experience with them. And, uh, and also I did, you know, internet sites and stuff like that. I didn't use Winnipeg. I just wanted to go to some more, some of their personal things that they did themselves. Uh, I left. A lot of what my so far as I, people asking me, why did you leave Ty, Ty Cobb, you know, the great baseball uh, player? Why did you leave him out? Well, I only had so much room. <laughs> so I'm hoping that uh, you know, if, if I do a next book, I, that's what I'll, I'll I'll listen to everybody's comments about who, who we should be in there because there are lots of Georgians, very distinguished Georgians. I just like to do some of the ones that uh, uh, help people. Uh, a lot of our philosophy, I think, with a magazine was we should we should uh, uh, give power to people who have no power. So that's that's kind of a good theme if you look through the book. And there are a lot of bad guys in there. You know, Marvin Griffin. Uh, he got uh, his big comment was that he, he put the Georgia flag. You know, the stars and bars. That's where that came from, uh, when they tried to do segregation in the schools. And uh, he, he got beat though. Georgia didn't really like, you know, uh, uh, the racial part, part, politics that he put out. So when he got beat, he said he, they had barbecues like, like Gene Towers did all over the state. And he said, uh, famously, he said, well, people ate my barbecue, but I don't think they love voting for me, though. Which they did. <laughs> and Lester Maddox, in the 50s, he had a, a restaurant. He became governor by a real fluke, and that's a real story. Uh, but he had a restaurant called the Pickwick, and he had axe hangers. Uh, and so the customers would go by, and he, would, he had a, he autographed his axe hangers meaning that he was going to, a black tried to come into his uh, restaurant, he would throw them out with a, with a uh, uh, axe hand. So when three or four young people came in to integrate his, his uh, restaurant, he had a gun and he chased them out with his pistol. So, and he was real funny, he just loved that. He told that story all the time. And uh, so when, uh, Martin Luther King came involved, got really involved with uh, Georgia. Uh, Georgia citizens went the ex extra uh, way to integrate the schools. And that happened all over the state. In Savannah, for instance, uh, the African American community was going to try to integrate the restaurants and the uh, drugstores and the schools. So the white community got together 
and they marched down the Broad Street and, and uh, to integrate all the schools and everything, including the mayor. And, and so that was a great story. Same thing happened in Albany, Georgia. Martin Luther King came down to Albany uh, to try to get integration and the schools together. And it was a big fight about it. But they finally had a, a, black, a black man ran for city council and got elected. And the city council voted to do away with all the anti-discrimination laws in the city. So there's stories like that all over Georgia. And Georgia uh, has been one of the highlights, I think, for the whole nation over this period to uh, give people freedom for all colors. Another question? <laughs> oh yeah, I know Ted. He, he's still alive, you know. So, uh, yeah, he's one of my favorite oh, he's a great, great character. And uh, I mean, you know, if you want to find some, an inspiration to somebody that just looks out to, out to, you know, to the stars, you know, he would be it. Uh, and uh, he just, I said, he changed the world. He did. We just been and I, we just saw him, and uh, recently, you yeah. know. And look, we have a lot of uh, famous people. I, I think you'll enjoy uh, reading about all, all these folks. And they're, they're unfortunately, like I say, I'm, it's not of today's politics. I have been real careful about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, I hope it will be some inspiration to everybody. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.